am an alcoholic. Um, it is just so nice to see. I'm just scrolling through and looking at all your faces, and it just makes me so happy to see all of these alcoholics together. God, you guys are a sight for sore eyes. I am a preschool teacher, and I've been sober. Oh, my God, it's still going. This is incredible. I've been sober since March 7th of 2008, and, um, you know, it's been a long, strange trip. Um, I am 34 now, and I got sober when I was 22. So if you're young and in recovery, um, this too can work for you. And if you're middle-aged in recovery, uh, this could work for you too. And if you're older and you're getting into recovery, this can also work for you. Um, God, I've been moving a lot over the last year. Um, I just moved from my home where Sean and I met in Prescott, Arizona. And my husband and I went and lived abroad with our toddler, well, I guess in Central America, so not abroad, um, last year. And then over the summer, I went and took a Montessori teacher training class. And the typical story for people in recovery is that you get sober when you're young, and then you go to college, and then you're super successful. And that has not been the case for me. Um, I have extreme amounts of anxiety around schoolwork. And this will be the first course. Um, God willing that I have finished since I got sober. So that is kind of exciting. Um, I really enjoyed teaching preschool. Um, the kids are amazing, but teaching over Zoom can be a little bit difficult sometimes. And I'm really grateful that I discovered the mute button about three weeks in. Um, otherwise I was hearing about the way that someone's poop looks and um, what they had for dinner and why those two things correlate. So, um, March 7th of 2008, I, um, I found a new level of bottom. Um, I had started drinking at 14. By 15, I was a daily drinker. And by 16, my family decided that it would be a good idea to put me in um, a wilderness therapy program and then a therapeutic boarding school. Um, these are institutions, and one of them does not exist anymore because it was a bit abusive. So. Um, lots of fun things happened there. Um, one of the fun things that I learned there was that you can't really be an alcoholic until you're older and that eventually I would learn how to drink again. Um, you know, it wasn't really, it was talked about and they said that if you drank or used in the first year, you would probably rip your family apart again. So there was like a whole lot of like shame and guilt that I had to go through when I started doing my inventory. So. I went there when I was 16. I got out uh, about a month and a half before I turned 18. And then by the time I was, um, I got into a bunch of different colleges, um, mainly because they wrote really nice, please accept her letters. And um, then I promptly dropped out of college after my uh, first year. It was, I think, the week before finals. And I ended up in rehab um, all over again. I hadn't been caught sober for about two months at that point um and i just i drank from pretty much sun up until sundown and um sometimes if i woke up in the night i also drink then so that's part of my story but the thing that separates me from other drinkers is that when i start drinking i want more and then after i've stopped for a while i think to myself I'm not really an alcoholic and I can try this one more time. And then I start drinking again and then I absolutely have to have more. And then I stop drinking again and it's like five minutes and I'm like, you know what? That wasn't really all that bad. Like I could still drink. And then I stop drinking again and then I start back up again. And then I wonder sometimes if I'm an alcoholic, right? Because I'm 22 and I'm way too fucking young to be an alcoholic. And then I start drinking again. And then I stopped drinking and then I started drinking again. And if you've ever tried to get sober on your own, um, which if you're in an AA meeting, I'm guessing that most of you have, um, then you know what that hamster wheel feels like and it sucks. Um, I got sober in Salt Lake City. I got sober in Young People's and it was batshit crazy. Um, I was batshit crazy. I, um, I had a lot of anger that was all pent up and then I would try and keep it like in one of those nice new Instapots and just like pressure that bitch in. 
And occasionally it just went and it got everywhere and it got really gross. And I was emotionally and verbally and physically abusive to the people that I loved, including my family from the time I was about 16. And um, that's what happens to me when I start drinking is I'm, I'm a monster. Um, and I, I want to emotionally and physically harm people. And, um, and I don't feel good about myself. And then I start drinking every day and my eyes start doing weird things where one woman is looking at you and the other one starts going over here and then it kind of drifts back over and then this one goes over that way. And um, it just didn't go well for me. Um, so that was what it was like. And what happened is that the people that I was living with said, you either need to get sober or you need to move out. And um, I was, you know, very confused as to why they wanted me to move out. It's not like I'd stolen $3,000 and, um, you know, like not been sober for a couple of months and had the boyfriend that I was dating moving my new boyfriend in um, because, you know, that's just what you do when you're 22 and serious alcoholic is that you take advantage of people and, um, you know, you do things that don't really align with your values. And it sucked and I was miserable and I thought I was gonna be the life of the party until at least my 30s. And I never planned on having children and I never planned on getting married. And um, I thought that I would probably, you know, do one of those good old like take you out before you're 27 and, um, and be done with it. And um, you know, that's, I, suicidal ideation is, is deep in my bones and I didn't start addressing that until I was about three years sober. And anybody that says that like, oh, we don't talk about suicide and it's like, we kind of do. It's all through Bill's story, you know, when it talks about, you know, the beginning of Bill's story and he's watching people jump from the towers of high, of the high towers of finance or whatever they, that whole thing is, you know, he's like, I'm not going to do that. And that's how I started out with life. I was like, I'm not going to be an alcoholic because I knew alcoholism ran through my family. And then by the time I got some booze in me and I was like, oh, this feels good. Like I'm okay right now. Um, and, and the races were off, I started thinking, maybe I should just off myself. And those two things were always very intertwined for me because I could never parse out like getting mentally well from being alcoholic. It was always this thing where they were really married and intertwined and I, I couldn't parse it out. I went to a lot of therapists. I went to a lot of different things to try and figure it out. And the only thing that ever got that part of my brain better was getting sober and then working through it. So when I say working through it, I don't mean like I got a good therapist and we talked about it a lot, which is part of my story, but that's not the part that I'm talking about here. The part that I'm talking about here is steps one through 12. And so, you know, step one, I had enough experience. And this is why when somebody new comes into AA, I'm not like, oh, you can just stay here forever. Don't drink, don't drink. I'm like, no, if you're not done, go, go get done you know, and that seems really shitty to a lot of people, but that's what I had to do to save my life, you know, and there, I, a lot of people don't make it in, and that sucks, we lose a lot of people in AA, and that sucks, you know, and I would have been one of those people had I kept trying to stay sober without really figuring out that I was an alcoholic, um, so I had to try everything, you know, I had to try drinking in the morning and not drinking in the morning and losing my job and not losing my job and having a boyfriend and not having a boyfriend and having a girlfriend and not having a girlfriend and moving to a different state and not moving to a different state. And all those things that you do, um, I'm about to get interrupted here. It's a tiny person in a moose shirt. So just, you can wave if you'd like. This is my human. Um, so, you wanna go with daddy? No. Okay. Um, so at that point, I started to have a spiritual experience and I realized that I really was powerless over alcohol and that no matter how many times I tried, it was not going to get better. Um, and when I had that realization and I was so frustrated by it, I was angry at Alcoholics Anonymous for a long time because I didn't want to be alcoholic. I thought that this was going to be the party killer and that's not been true for me. Um, in a way it was, I mean, like I don't, you know, do lots of drugs and drink anymore, which is, you know, the end of that party, but a whole different party started. So step two, um, I came to believe that people in AA were sane and that they had felt like I before I got here. I see your pony over there. Are you going to go get your pony? 
can show Daddy my watch? Go show him. No, no, no. Oh, no, no. So step three, um, you know, I turn my will and my life over to the idea that Oh, that's so creepy, Hal. So um, there's like, just like a small chance that things might get better, you know? And it wasn't a large chance. I see Bella. Um, and then step four was where I put all of my stuff down on paper for the first couple times I tried to get sober and I shoved it up the back of a couch so that no one would ever find it. Um, but when I got sober this time, I had a sponsor who was like, okay, we're gonna sit out on the picnic table and we're gonna be here until it's done. And we sat there and it must've been like eight hours, man. It felt like forever. And then she said, okay, go hang out in your room and like get close with God for an hour. And I was like, is that really gonna do anything? You know? And um, I was able to see that some of my character defects were harming myself and the people around me. And I, I genuinely wanted those things to be gone. And this is where, you know, step three came back in. Because I thought, you know, if other people this has worked for, maybe my character defects will be gone too. Okay, you gotta go in the other room. Mommy's gotta finish her meeting. Go take my watch to daddy. And when this meeting, when this hand is on the sixth, then I'll be done. And I'll get you up to the circle. Somebody put Dora on in the other room. So I am yesterday's news now. Um, yeah, step six and seven are the ones that, like, I continuously retread. You know, there are always character defects coming up in my life that I have to look at. I have to reassess, you know. Step nine, I've been making a living amends to the people that I love for a very long time. I'm learning some new boundaries with that, which has been interesting. I take a daily inventory. I call my sponsor, you know, pretty much every morning. I'm a little neurotic. I think that's relatively true for alcoholics. We're a little neurotic. Not a lot, just a little, you know sarcasm and um yeah step 11 you know I called earlier today with the issue that I was having and I was talking to my sponsor and instead of saying well why don't you go do this and why don't you go do that she's like okay let's meditate and so for like 15-20 minutes you know we read a meditation and then we meditate together over the phone and um that's been the thing that's really been my bread and butter um, you know, when I'm having emotional difficulties, when I'm having relationship difficulties, when I'm having work difficulties, I really, the only thing that I can do sometimes being a preschool teacher, because I can't be like, you're going to have to wait. I know you just shot your pants, but I'll be right back, you know, because you can't say that to a preschool. You have to literally take the turd out of their pants, you know? So sometimes it's just a deep breath, you know, and it's asking the universe to let me be responsible and kind and gentle you know, in this moment, you know, help me to be kind in this moment, help me to see a way to be kind in this moment, and, um, you know, in step 12, I, I get calls from people, and it's kind of random, but a lot of them don't live in my state, you know, when I was living in Costa Rica last year, I got a call from a chick in Utah, and we've been friends ever since, and she calls me, and she talks about getting sober, and she talks about all this stuff, you know, she's not willing to do the steps yet, and that's okay for her, you know, and then there's some other people that call, and they're like, I really want to do the steps right now, and I'm like, okay, let's go do the steps, and then we go through the steps, you know, and I've, I've found that my place is not in judgment of how other people find the universe, that, um, that people are allowed to be who they are, and, um, you know, over the last couple of months since, you know, not being able to work and being at home. And I've been living with my in-laws since last August. So um, they're amazing and they cook me dinner every night. But the thing that I have the hardest time accepting is who I am in this moment and who everybody else is in this moment. You know, and people are always like, well, just say the serenity prayer. I can't figure out, I don't have the wisdom to figure out what I can and can't change. So I changed up a bit for myself. You know, and this is part of, like, my conscious contact is that, you know, I try and, like, find God in all moments of my life. And so, you know, the thing that's been working for me lately is saying, God, grant me the serenity to, to accept myself and others as we are, the courage to love, and the wisdom to be kind, you know, and, and that looks a little bit different um, with all these other things, but I'm a sick puppy. You know, and in my mind, I think that if I just do it right, 
I'll be able to change something, you know? And that's not, I, I don't think that that's the universe's will for me today. I think the universe's will for me today is to accept where I am, to accept where other people are. And that doesn't mean that I have to accept shitty behavior. You know, that doesn't mean that I have to like, someone punches me in the face and I'm like, oh, you should punch me in the face again. No, that means like you punch me in the face and I need to change my behavior in a loving, kind way and get out of your life. You know, not that anyone's punched me in the face recently. Um, but metaphorically speaking, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, so those are kind of the things that I'm going through today. Um, since I've been sober, I have gotten back into therapy. I have done a lot of other things that have been, you know, those have been the next right step for me. And it's not always easy. Sometimes it's like getting a colonoscopy. Um, you know, you, you have to do a lot of footwork at the beginning of it. And then there's a lot of shit. And then you're, you feel kind of like weird for a minute. And then you wake up and all your shit's different. It's not better, but it's different, you know, and some of it's a little cleaner. So, um, yeah, I, have I run out of my 15, 20 minutes yet? Am I done? Is it over? You, you got, you, you're almost out. You got a couple more. You can, you got like okay, two more minutes. Okay. So some of the coolest things that have happened in my sobriety have been number one at about seven, eight years of sobriety. I prayed to have all my anger and resentments removed. And a lot of them were, and I had like real issues with rage and I haven't felt that way in a long time. Not to say that I don't get angry and not to say that I don't get frustrated, but it hasn't been the same level. Um, I have a tiny human in my life that I made with my body and that has been incredible. Um, I didn't know I could have a baby. I didn't think I could have a baby. We'd been trying for a while and that wasn't going so hot. And then I went into the hospital with really gnarly stomach pain and found out I had cancer. And then two months after that, when all of the test results were back from having cancer, they were like, you're pregnant. I was like, you're fucking with me. And that's not cool. But I was, you know, and um, my marriage hasn't been perfect. There's been things that I would have done differently, um, you know, as a human being in a relationship with another sober human being. But um, you know, I feel like at this point, every mistake that I've made up until now has been the literal shit that has grown in the flower beds of somebody else. You know, it's been the fertilizer for the basis of me being useful. Um, so, you know, I, I've learned to be a lot more gentle with myself over the last while. Um, you know, and I, I work with, small children and I tell them that there's, you know, there's no mistakes in our classroom. You know, you're not making mistakes, you're just learning, you know? And I try to give myself that same benefit of the doubt that today I'm learning as a human being um, rather than going into the whole red column on my 10th step. You know, I can see it as a measured thing now rather than just one side or the other. None of that would be possible in my life um, if I hadn't gotten sober. I would not have known that I had cancer in my appendix. I would not have known that I wanted to have a baby. I would not have known that I wanted to be a good daughter because none of that would have mattered. Um, so if you're new to the program and you're feeling kind of squirrely, it really does get better. You'll feel squirrely, but in a different way. Um, like the squirrel that found all the nuts, 